encourage you at this time, we're going to turn over to Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30 is our passage for today. We'll be looking at two models of Christ-minded living, or two models of a Christ-minded life. Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. Paul says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father he hath served with me in the gospel. Him therefore I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he, that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him. And not, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow, I sent him therefore, and more, the more carefully, that when you see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Let's open up the service one more time in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is effective for our lives to guide us, to lead us in the ways of Christ, to point us towards um, lives that are worthy of the gospel, as Paul described earlier in this chapter. Lord, I pray your blessing as we work through this passage together this morning, that our eyes would be opened, our hearts would be receptive to what you have to teach us, and we give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes you read portions of scripture and uh, you might wonder, why would God use up the valuable space of his inspired word on this? Uh, you ever read a passage and felt that way? Maybe particularly in the Old Testament, maybe some of those minor prophets or chronicles or numbers and you think, you know, this is kind of, this is kind of tedious. And when we're talking about the inspired word of God and this book, that has everything that we need um, for life and godliness and living for the Lord, why would God take up the space to, uh, to record this in particular? Well, if I'm being honest, that was kind of my view as I was reading through this passage. Um, not something you often hear a pastor say, maybe. But when it comes to um, preaching the word of God, um, there are passages that just preach. You know what I'm saying? And most of Philippians is a book that just preaches, and we've been working through this systematically, expositorily for uh, the last several times that I've had the opportunity to preach. And Paul so far has been coasting through chapters one and two with some hard-hitting doctrine, some truths that are very practical to our lives as believers, and particularly um, for our lives as an organism, a church living together. How do we interact with one another? How do we function in ministry together successfully for the sake of the gospel? Paul has been hitting this real heart. And, uh, and it's been challenging. It's been encouraging. And then right kind of smack in the middle here at the end of chapter two, um, it's like he shifts gears. Um, and instead of continuing on the building of just wonderful truth about how we as Christians should live, it's like he takes a pause and decides that he's going to take some time to talk, talk about a travel itinerary. Um, for himself, for in particular two men named Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now, some of you, some of you might like a good itiner itinerary, a travel itinerary. In fact, I know a couple of you really do. And um, that's kind of the stage that we're in this summer. Pastors on vacation. Megan and I go on vacation next week, and uh, that's exciting. And all those that are going on vacation, what do you do before you go on vacation? 
you create an itinerary. At least you should, if you're going to have a, a, any hopes of having a good time on vacation. Um, and some of you do that very detailed. Some of you just kind of do a general itinerary. But at the very least, you have to make some plans. How are you going to get there? I mean, the dates, first of all, right? When are you going to do it? Um, how you're going to get there? What you're going to do when you get there? Um, well, it kind of seems like that's what, what Paul is doing here. He's taking time out of this letter to just record some travel um, plans for two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus. And as we're reading through this, I'm kind of thinking, why here? And maybe you're doing the same. And if you've ever read Philippians, chances are you're reading through when you get to this passage and you just kind of, you read it, but you skim through it and then you, it's almost with the mentality of, I'm going to get to the good stuff after this. And uh, I'll be honest, when I came to this passage, I thought maybe, maybe I should preach something else. Maybe I should jump ahead. But of course, you can't do that if you're preaching expositorily. And if we believe that every word of God is inspired and important and valuable to us, then there is something here valuable for us to learn and to glean. And as I began to study, I realized more and more that Paul had a specific reason and why he included this travel itinerary right here in this passage at this specific point. And I think as we work through this, you're also going to see Paul's purpose in recording this travel plan. And in particular, you're gonna see some attributes, some description of these two worthy men, Timothy and Epaphroditus, that Paul was putting forth as examples for you and I, and for the church at Philippi, certainly, of what he has been talking about so far in the book of Philippians. Now, it's been a while since we've been here, so uh, just in way of review, let's remind ourselves about what Paul has been talking about. The central issue of the book was in chapter 1, verse 27, where Paul teaches us to live in such a way as to demonstrate the truth of the gospel. He says that we ought to walk worthy of the gospel. So the gospel of Jesus Christ, the wonderful truth that God sent his son Jesus down on earth to die for the sins of mankind, to die for your sins, my sins, so that we have a relationship with Jesus and we have eternity in heaven. Paul says that wonderful gospel, that wonderful truth it's not just a ticket to heaven. It is now a new way of life for you as believers. So walk worthy of it. Also in verse 27 of chapter 1, Paul teaches the important truth of unity, having a unified spirit, mind, striving together for the sake of the, of the gospel. We are not independent once we are saved. We are now part of an organism. We are part of a body, the church. Paul says, if you're going to function well as a body, you need to do so in unity, together. Verse 28, Paul teaches us to be fear, fearless lovers of the truth, not to back down in the face of opposition against the truth of the gospel, to remain strong in the teachings of the gospel. In chapter 2, we see Paul then getting specific about how we should achieve these goals of walking worthy of the gospel in humility, that we should do nothing, nothing in selfishness that we should do nothing in selfishness or deceit, but that we should count others as more valuable, more significant than ourselves. For a church to function well in unity together, selflessness must be present. To have a body that works well together, you have to have people that are not self-minded, but others-minded, putting others first. And then we saw the wonderful passage in chapter two, of the example that Paul puts forth, the greatest example that Paul puts forth, of, forth on this, which is the example of Jesus Christ. Verse five says, have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus. This is the passage we read at the beginning of the service. Who made himself of no reputation. He took, it, he, took it, he took aside the reputation of him as a son of God. Though still God, he came to man willing to humble himself. He took on the form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of man. He humbled himself. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And it goes on to say that all would confess that Jesus Christ is who? Lord, to the glory of, uh, to the glory of God the Father. And so he's working through this and he is building and he is building and we have this wonderful example of humility and sacrifice that we are to emulate through Jesus Christ. And then we get here to verse 19 with the travel plans of Timothy and Epaphroditus. Why? I believe that Paul puts this here 
certainly to inform them of what is coming, but I think in Paul's mind, he is realizing these are two men. As I have been working through this teaching centered on the humility of Jesus and how we ought to walk worthy of the gospel, here are two men that put, put forth such a worthy example that now is the time to record their plans as well as a little bit of information about these two men for the benefit of the church at Philippi, but now for us 21st century Christians to also see what does it look like to live with the mind of Christ? What does it look like to demonstrate practically the humility that we see demonstrated in the gospel? And so we have here this informative section of scripture that also gives a wonderful example, two wonderful examples of men that demonstrated the humility of Christ practically in their lives. First, we see the testimony of Timothy and what we'll call the heart of a selfless servant. Timothy, the selfless servant. Look down at verses 19 through 22. Paul says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send you, Timotheus, or Timothy, shortly unto you, that I I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. But ye know the proof of him that as a son with a father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Now, you might remember right at the very beginning of chapter 1, verse 1, Paul includes Timothy in his greeting, attributing the whole letter of Philippians as being from himself and from Timothy. Paul, because he was in prison, was unable to come to the church at Philippi, though he desperately, clearly, he desperately wanted to be there. So instead, he had plans to send Timothy first to minister to them in his stead. Timothy was considered by Paul as um, a great and faithful companion throughout his missionary journeys and his ministry in general. And though we don't know a lot about the personal life of Timothy, there are a few things that we do know that we have learned uh, from the word and from history in general. Um, Timothy was a native of Lystra. Now, Lystra, it was a city in what we call modern-day Turkey now. Um, He was born to a Jewish mother whose name was Eunice, and uh, he had a Greek father. His grandmother, Lois, um, was converted to Christianity along with his mother, Eunice, um, and they were the ones that were attributed with bringing up Timothy. And it's believed that both Timothy's mother and grandmother came to know Christ through Paul's first missionary journey. So it's a wonderful story of two women coming to Christ, and then we have young Timothy who is being brought up in the way of Scripture, the way of the Word, um, by these two faithful ladies. According to Paul, Timothy... Um, he, he was taught the scriptures from a young age. We see that in 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 15. And then after Timothy was ordained to minister alongside Paul, he then accompanied Paul often on his missionary journey. And, and Timothy will see often used in, in the New Testament as the messenger of Paul. Uh, When Paul could not be somewhere, as we see exemplified here in Philippi, he would often send Timothy in his stead. Paul often commended Timothy in his writings as he does here in Philippians. And he takes this opportunity here to use Timothy as an example of what it means to live a selfless life for the sake of the gospel. And in particular, we're going to see three examples of selflessness set forth here by Timothy. Number one, in Timothy's example of selflessness, Timothy had a sincere care for the body of Christ. Timothy had a sincere care for the body of Christ. Verse 20 says, for I have no man I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. The literal literal interpretation here is, I have no one like Timothy who has a natural, that means literally genuine, who has a genuine concern for your welfare. Now, I don't think Paul is saying that there is no other that is faithful in their work and their ministry for the gospel. Um, And I think that's proven in just a few verses because he's about to talk about the faithfulness of Epaphroditus. So he's not being extreme here or melodramatic by saying that I have no one like Timothy, but I think he's pointing out the particular value of Timothy to himself. Timothy was special to Paul, clearly. Timothy was Paul's ride or die kind of guy. 
his most faithful partner and companion. When a job needed to get done, Paul looked to Timothy to do it. He had full faith, full trust in Timothy. Timothy was Paul's right-hand man. Why? Paul says, because they were like-minded. Paul says, I can trust in this man, Timothy, because we are of the same mind. We are in tune to the same thing. The thing that motivates me is the same thing that motivates Timothy. What we understand and what we believe about the worthiness of Christ in the gospel, it's the exact same thing. It's the same motivation. We are like-minded in our endeavors in this life for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the ministry, for the sake of the church. I have full faith in this man, Timothy. There was no one, li- no one else like him in the mind of Paul. Folks, when it came to loving the church, Timothy was second to none. Timothy wasn't just serving out of obligation or duty. He wasn't just checking off some box when it came to his service for Christ. Timothy looked to have genuine interest in the lives and the affairs of the Philippian church. The encouragement here to us is follow the example of Timothy. Follow the example of Timothy. Oh, that the church would be filled with like-minded people who genuinely care for the welfare of God's people. We are all called as followers of Christ to meet the needs of our fellow believers. And as we see this taught over and over again in scriptures, we see this exemplified in the book of Acts by the early church, that this was the way that they lived. They cared not for themselves, but for one another. We see it taught over and over again in the New Testament. Galatians 6, 2 says, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Romans 12, 13, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. That's the calling that we have one to another. And then you can remember just a few verses ago in Philippians 2, uh, verses three through five, Paul says, let each, what? Esteem others better than themselves. Looking on every man on his own thing, but every, thing, every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you who is in who? Jesus Christ. Wow, all right? So we have the example of Christ, and then Paul says, here's a human like you, example of the same thing. Here is someone that, like me, has been moved by the gospel. He is a lover of the word, a lover of Jesus. And in turn, that same love that changed him is now magnified and put out to you as the body of Christ. Paul and Timothy were like-minded because they were both fully invested in the heart, the mind of Jesus Christ, which is a mind that thinks first on the care, the love, and the welfare of the body of Christ. Timothy had a sincere care for the church, but we also see number two, Timothy prioritized the interests of Christ. Timothy prioritized the interests of Christ. Verse 21 says, for all seek their own not the things which are Jesus Christ. Now, again, it kind of feels like Paul's being a little melodramatic here. All seek their own, not the things of Jesus Christ. Now, I I don't believe that's the case here. I don't think Paul is throwing all of his other co-laborers under the bus here. Imagine if you were another servant of Paul reading this. You're like, wait a minute. (laughs) I'm here. I I feel like I'm trying to serve the Lord too. Um, I don't think that's what Paul's doing. He's not saying there's no one else that has a heart for God, but I think he's drawing attention instead to the likely fact that In general, people tend to think of who first and prioritize who first? Themselves. And let's be honest, when we are left to our default selves, that's what we do as well, do we not? Our default in the flesh is to think of us, think of number one and our needs, our wants, our desires, what will help us. Paul is making a general observation that people tend to look out for themselves above others, but not so with Timothy. I think it's important also to remember here that Paul had earlier in the the book talked about some contemporaries of his, some preachers uh, that were not preaching for the glory of Christ. Remember this? They were preaching for selfish gain or they were preaching out of envy and strife for the sake of the gospel. Certainly, Paul probably had them in mind as well. In fact, let's read that in Philippians 1, 15 through 16. Paul says, some indeed preach Christ even of envy, strife, and some also of goodwill. So we have these two. We have some preaching of goodwill, but we have some that are preaching envy and strife. The one preached Christ of contention, 
not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bond. So you have this kind of weird thing going on where you have people preaching Christ, but not with the heart of Christ. Though they were proclaiming, proclaimed Christians, giving the gospel, they were doing so with selfish ambition and the, and the goal of personal glory going on. Folks, I hope we realize that it is not enough to just do the action of ministry. And I'm so thankful for those who are willing to put themselves into the fray. They are, they are willing to serve in ways that they can for the ministry of the gospel, for the sake of the church. But I think it's important that we remember that the why of what we do is vital. To serve for the sake of of being seen or recognized or simply to, to boost your own self-esteem is not the correct motivation. Verse 17 of chapter one, Paul says that in contrast to those who were seeking to minister for, for, for selfish gain or out of envy and strife, you have those who were serving for the right reason, which was what? Love, it says. So you have, in contrast to selfish servants, you have servants that were giving the gospel out of a heart of genuine love for God and for people. This is the motivation that drives us. We serve not for selfish gain, but because we have been changed by the gospel of Christ and we are obsessed with bringing glory to our God. How is this done? We become seekers of the things that matter to Jesus. And we see this exemplified in Timothy number three. Timothy's proof of servanthood was seen in his service for the sake of the gospel. Timothy's proof of servanthood was seen in his service for the sake of the gospel. Look back down at verse 22 through 24. It says, but you know the proof of him, that as a son with the father, he has served with me in the gospel. Paul is saying, you know him. You've seen him prove what I am saying in his service for the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, to, presently so soon as I, as I shall see him, it will go with me, for I trust in the Lord that I also myself will come shortly. We all probably know someone who talks a lot louder than they walk. I enjoy playing sports. Um, I played either organized or pick up sports most of my life. And one thing I've, I've noticed when playing sports is that there's usually that one guy. The one guy that um, talks a whole lot. He talks a whole lot in practice and he, and he talks a whole lot out on the field and he talks a whole lot about uh, the game and, and how things should be done. And uh, he may even have a whole lot of knowledge about the game itself. But when it actually comes to putting actual talent to the sport that he talks a lot about, he's a little bit lacking when he comes out onto the field. You know what I'm talking about? Anyone play sports and know what I'm talking about? There's just always that one guy that likes to talk. But he often cannot back up how he talks with the actual play. And that is really the proof of the value, right? Some of you are like, I've never experienced that person. Well, if you haven't experienced it, you might be that person. I don't know. Um, <laughs> typically, the one person in the field that doesn't um, see it is the person itself. So um, we know somebody like this, though. Um, and we've seen people act this way in, uh, they have a big talk. And they have good intentions. They mean well, but when it comes to actually proving out their value or their work ethic, their ability to do something, they are severely lacking in it. This was not the case with Timothy. Paul tells us that Timothy had proven his worth by his action, specifically his action of service that promotes and benefits the what? The work of the gospel. You say you love the gospel, that's wonderful, but are you proving it by your action? Are you proving it by the time that you put in and by your dedication to it? I think this speaks to Timothy's perseverance and faithful, faithfulness in the ministry and to Paul day in and day out. He was not a flash in the pan kind of servant. He proved his ability to endure and to grind for the work of the ministry. 
And Paul had utmost faith that while he hoped to be able to be with the Philippians someday, he knew that he could send Timothy in his stead and they would be well taken care of. They would be well ministered to because Timothy had proven himself faithful. I want to take a moment and just say I'm so thankful. As I was preparing this message, I, I kept thinking of person after person after person here at Lighthouse who I could call a Timothy. People who are willing uh, to serve, and not just in word, but have proven so in their desire to jump in and to help out. And for, for, for those that are, are that kind of, of person, that kind of servant, um, Pastor Whitmer and I are so thankful for you. It's a wonderful blessing to know that we are not alone in ministry and that we have people that we can look to and rely on and say, these are people that we are like-minded with that understand the gospel and they understand the value of it and they understand the work of the ministry and the importance of the church and they are willing to bear up with us and serve. I praise the Lord that Lighthouse is such a tremendous example of this and I encourage you, keep on. Keep on having that same kind of servant's heart, that desire uh, to not just in word serve, but to actually prove it in action and to be that kind of faithful example as we see here in Timothy. I want to note here that while we just examined that why you serve is important, uh, it's not just enough to do so. You have, I mean, the why of doing it um, for the sake of the gospel is important, but but I think it's important to note here the how as well. How you serve is important. So if you have someone who says, I am willing, I have a heart to, to serve, I want to serve, and then they back it up like Timothy, an example by jumping in and doing things and serving, that's wonderful. But there's a little bit of a note here about how Timothy does this. And you see it in the phrase where he says, Timothy has served as a son with the father. So he says, Timothy, the, here's, how, here, here's how Timothy is serving. He has a heart, he's doing it, and here's how he's doing it. He's doing it like the relationship of a father and son working cohesively in unity together for the sake of the gospel. I think Timothy's, Timothy's example here is an example of cooperative service cooperative service for the gospel. That example of a relationship of a father and a son who are working close like a team together for the cause of Christ. That is the calling of the church, is it not? That we work together cooperatively, not as individuals, not independently, not going rogue on your own in ministry, but working well together as a healthy, properly functioning body of Christ. The how that we, of what we do is important. Too often we see Christians that have desire to serve, but rather than serve in humility and cooperatively with other believers, they often want to serve only on their own terms. They want to do things their way. And if they cannot do it their way or exactly how they would like or in the same, um, in the ministry that they want, exactly how they want, then they become either angry or, or, or perhaps they even leave the church or they become disengaged Folks, that kind of example cannot function in a church long. We need people that care about the how and recognize that to do this in unity, to do this thing we call ministry in unity, it requires an action of humility, of the desire that, you know, I, I want to serve and I'm gonna serve where I need to, where I'm asked to. I want to serve and, and the way that I can be most helpful the how that we serve is important. Every believer here today should be asking the question, have I proved myself in my work for Christ? Have I proved myself in my work for Christ? Are you consistent in your walk with the Lord? Are you prioritizing the assembly of the church, the gathering together of the saints? Can people count on you to do your part in the body of Christ with humility and unity, but also in cooperation with one another? Timothy proved himself. He passed the test. And so as Paul says here, he felt confident in sending him on to minister to the Philippians in his stead. Timothy clearly was a special person to Paul. And in his own words, Paul said he had no one else like him. 
And so he offers Timothy as a role model to the Philippians and to us today as a selfless servant who had a sincere care for the body of Christ, who put the interest of Christ first and proved himself in his work for the gospel. Timothy is a great example of an unselfish ser- servant. And this now brings us to Paul's second example. And this second example goes by the name of Epaphroditus. And we're going to call Epaphroditus the sacrificial servant. Epaphroditus, the sacrificial servant. Look down at verses 25 through 30. Paul says, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. I like the wording there. I suppose. Suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto, de- unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. So, before Paul would send Timothy to minister, he first needed a messenger to deliver the very letter that he was writing. And that messenger was going to be the original messenger out of Philippi, whose name was Epaphroditus. Now, what do we know about Epaphroditus? Not a whole lot. I think it's interesting, though, to note that Epaphroditus, his actual name comes from a pagan origin, and it means belonging to Epaphroditus. Belonging to Epaphroditus is the meaning of this man's name, Epaphroditus, or Epaphrodite, belonging to Epaphrodite. Are you confused yet? The name of this Greek goddess was the origin of Epaphroditus's name. I think it's a tremendous testament to the power of the gospel. And think about it. God includes here as one of the most faithful servants to Paul, recorded in scripture for generations to come, a man by the name of belonging to Epaphrodite, a pagan god. But no longer serving the pagan god, but one who has been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now he is a servant of the one, the true, the living God. And he's a servant of Paul and certainly of Jesus Christ. Tremendous example of the power of the gospel to change lives. And this man named Epaphroditus. We don't know a whole lot about Epaphroditus, but while Paul was under house arrest in Rome, the church in Philippi desired to send Paul uh, what we might call a care package. A, a care package. It was a financial gift, perhaps some other things as well. And uh, the Philippian believers gathered supplies, money, and they sent them to Rome um, in the hands of this man named Epaphroditus. What do we know about Epaphroditus here in the passage of Philippians? The first thing we see in the example of Epaphroditus is that sacrifice and suffering will be part of ministry. Sacrifice and suffering will be part of ministry. Verses 25 through 26 say, Yeah, I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother. It says here, companion in labor, fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. So again, he's alluding here to the one that brought this care package that came and ministered on your behalf for my sake, for he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been what? Sick. All right? So notice here in this passage the accolades that Paul gives to Epaphroditus. He says, my brother. Now, Paul called Timothy his son, like his son. He calls Epaphroditus like a brother to him. He says, companion in labor, one who worked alongside of Paul. Paul says, fellow soldier. And, and that idea of soldier there is implying trials and conflict. And, and some, one, one commentator actually um, said that it's possible that Epaphroditus was even under arrest with Paul for a period of time while he was there in Rome. 
He was a messenger for the church, risking his life to deliver this gift to Paul. We'll talk about this in a minute, but don't take for granted this little, I mean, it's easy to look at Epaphroditus and say, oh, what did he do? He, he delivered a care package, big deal. No, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, about how much of a service um, of, of, of dedication, of sacrifice that that was for Epaphroditus to make that journey to deliver this gift to the apostle Paul. Once he arrived, it appears Epaphroditus stayed on with Paul and ministered to his needs despite the effects of being away from home. He went on this journey to help Paul, but certainly he was longing for his family, for his friends, for his church, for his home. So you read all of this, the accolades, and and, and you kind of begin to piece together a little bit about what Epaphroditus gave up to make this trip to see Paul. And you arrive at the conclusion that, wow, Paul is a, he's a, or Epaphroditus is a pretty great guy, right? A wonderful servant willing to do this, a faithful man of God willing to sacrifice his time and pause his entire life for several months, most likely, to deliver this package to Paul for the sake of Christ and what happens to him. Did he have a wonderful trip and a wonderful time and a wonderful experience on his mission to serve the Lord? No, he, it says he got sick. And not just like kind of sick, like Paul's not saying he, he had a bit of a cough, but he's good now. <laughs> no, it says he, he was sick almost unto death. We don't have the details, but this was a life-threatening kind of illness. Epaphroditus almost lost his life as he tried to make this journey of service for Paul and ultimately for Christ. The story of Epaphroditus teaches us that sacrifice and suffering certainly can and will be part of ministry. We are not exempt from it. This this section here reminded me of a mission trip that we took um, several years ago. Um, Dan Whitmer will remember this trip very well. Um, We went to Australia, um, and that was a a wonderful experience to minister to our missionaries, the Bowers. Um, And there was so much. I mean, I, looking back now, I was young and dumb, and that's why we planned a trip to Australia, um, because it was a nightmare, honestly. But it was, it, it was a wonderful blessing. The Lord worked things out, and um, we, I think it was 26 hours to get there, 26 hours of travel to get there with like 15 teens, and man, craziness. Um, but we were doing so with the heart of, of hopefully being a blessing to the Bowers and uh, for a wonderful experience of service for our teens. And we get there, and I mean, there's so much that goes into it. We finally arrive, and then half our group gets sick. And so we, we get there, we're exhausted, and it's like, all right, we're going to serve the Lord now. And then we wake up on whatever it was, Monday morning, and half my group is, is not getting out of bed because they're sick or they've been throwing up all night. So I'm thinking, Lord... We're trying to serve you here, and 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 I got half my group sick, and so you know it was it was frustrating, but we 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 kind of pressed on, and and thankfully after the first day or two, most everyone got better, and we were able to have a pretty productive trip, and and if you would talk to any of those teens, they would say they certainly learned a lot, and the Lord did a lot in that time, um, but we get to the end of the trip, and we I think we we've made it, we're we're at the airport, and we're getting ready to take off, and. Um, and one of our teens um, all of a sudden gets violently sick. And that teen is in this room right now. Um, and uh, he, he just gets violently sick. and It is no fault of his own. He just, he just got sick. And we're about, to, I, I'm literally on the escalator to go up to the gate. We have almost all the teens through. I hear someone yell back, and I think everyone's through security. And that's like the big thing. As a, like when you're taking a massive group like that, the big hurdle is everyone through security. Once you're through security, you feel a little bit better. Well, we're almost all through security, and then I hear, Dan threw up, Dan threw up. And I'm like, oh no, Lord, please, no. And we get back, I, I remember Megan going up the escalator, and, uh, and I didn't know that would be the last time I'd see her for what felt like years. Um, and so I, I run back down the escalator, I run back through security there in Australia, and uh, we were in Darwin, Australia, and, uh, and Dan's not feeling well. And so we are doing everything we can to like, can we get Dan through security somehow? Uh, well, there's a rule that if you are sick like that, you, you have to get a doctor's note to get back on the plane. They were going to make allowances for that, but Dan was not doing well. He wasn't feeling well. And in the end, and long story short, I, I don't really know what's happening, but next thing I know, I'm, I'm in a taxi going to the hospital with Dan and the rest of my group's going back home. Um, and 
the whole time I'm thinking, Lord, we're just trying to serve you here. Couldn't she just let us have a little bit of health to at least get us home? Um, and so the feelings of, of recognizing the, 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 the heart of Paul here is, is very real to us. Um, sometimes ministry throws you curveballs, and just because you are in ministry does not guarantee that God's going to keep you away from all hurt and harm and things that could go wrong in life. Ministry is difficult. It is hard at times, and it can cost you. And Epaphroditus is a good example of that. But we also see as we move on here that while trials are there, both burdens and joys are going to result from ministry. Both burdens and joys will result from ministry. Verses 27 through 28 um, are going to show us this. But before we get there, I want to consider um, some words here in verse 26. Paul says that Epaphroditus was full of what? Heaviness, all right? This is just a testament to the kind of man that Epaphroditus was. He's full of heaviness because he's sick, right? And he almost died. I would be full of heaviness too if I was sick and almost died trying to serve the Lord. Well, is that why he was full of heaviness? Well, no. In fact, it goes on to explain, and, and, and I think it's important there to note too, that word heaviness, uh, it literally means distress, all right? So, so Epaphroditus is under distress. And in the Greek, there are three words that are used to, inter- uh, that are interpreted as distress. And this one here is the most extreme of the three. In fact, the only other, only other place that it's used in the, in, the New, in the New Testament is when they were describing Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. So how distressed is Epaphroditus? pretty distressed, all right? But as we read there, we realize he's not distressed for himself, right? The logical cause would, would, would be that he is distressed because he almost died. But the reality is he was distressed because he didn't want his friends and his family to know of his illness and worry about him. Wow, what a guy, right? Epaphroditus is the kind of friend you want. All right? He's about to die. And he had this, like, Ill, this idea. I mean, he's literally on his deathbed. And he's like, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. I just don't want anybody to know. I don't, want, I don't want people to worry about me. I mean, just the testament of selflessness in the heart of Epaphroditus is palpable here. Epaphroditus shows us that even suffering can be used for the opportunity to give God glory and to continue to pour out to others and to care for others. Moving on here now to 27 through 28, Paul says, For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him again, ye may do what? Ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. So Epaphroditus almost died, but Paul says God had mercy on him. God healed him, thankfully. Um, and the illness that almost ended his life, God intervened on Epaphroditus' behalf. And Paul says that this was not only mercy on Epaphroditus, but mercy on himself. And you can imagine the heart of Paul and the feelings of distress on his own heart, realizing this man might die because he came to try to help me and the responsibility that that would have placed in the heart of Paul. And so Paul's desire is to send back to the church at Philippi a healthy Epaphroditus. And in turn, that was what was going to bring Paul joy, was knowing that Epaphroditus was safe and sound and home. That was what was going to relieve his sorrow. And again, I, I love the heart of Paul here. Folks, in Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus, there is another way of looking at life. There is a radically different perspective on life that we see exemplified in them. They do not care about their own well-being. And you see this over and over and over again. So even when things are not going well for themselves, they can still have joy. Paul demonstrates the joy that he has here for himself. No, he's gonna lose a brother, a fellow laborer, a co-soldier in the work of the ministry there in, or there in Rome. But what brings him joy? The benefit of knowing that the believers at Philippi will be blessed and that Epaphroditus will be safe and sound back home. His perspective is not him. His perspective is others. His perspective is the glory of God and the furtherance of the ministry. His perspective is the health of the church. 
That's what matters to him. And he knows that God is going to sustain the church no matter what. And so he is able to rejoice. And he encourages the people there in Philippi to rejoice as well. These words from Paul teach us that when having the mind of Christ, we can find unique and meaningful joy in ministry that we will never find anywhere else. You realize that the most joyful news of salvation is also the single most tragic event of history. When God himself was brutally killed on the cross for the sins of men. Christ's painful sacrifice providing the greatest message of hope and joy to a world who desperately needed him. Remember, Paul has just talked about the mind of Christ. And that this, this sacrifice of Christ, it brought joy. It brought pleasure to the heart of God, not to see his own son suffer, but to know that through his son's suffering, there will be a way made for all of men unto salvation and relationship with Jesus. Suffering and joy, right at the beginning of the gospel, are very closely intertwined. You see this represented over and over again in the New Testament and certainly here in this story of Epaphroditus and Timothy and Paul. Finally, we see here in verses 29 29 through 30 that the work of Christ is worthy of personal risk and sacrifice. The work of Christ is worthy of personal risk and sacrifice. Verse 29 through 30 says, Receive him therefore, so... Paul is encouraging the church at Philippi, receive Epaphroditus, therefore, in the Lord with what? With all gladness and hold such in reputation. That means throw a party for him. Celebrate his return. Celebrate his service. What he has done is worthy of honor because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. Celebrate his return and be thankful, rejoice in his effort to do what you could not, which was bring a package of hope and help to me. This was Paul's final encouragement regarding Epaphroditus to the church, that they would receive him with joy and assign unto him honor that he was worthy of, not for his own glory, but in recognition that he is doing something that is worthy of honor, which is serving the Lord which is living for the gospel. Let's not underestimate what it took for Epaphroditus to do what he did. Consider for a moment his task of delivering this package to Paul from Philippi in Rome. Sending a care package back then is not the same as today. We could accomplish what Epaphroditus did in 10 minutes. (laughs) Um, Back then it was not so to send something as far as Philippi would have been from Rome would have been a massive task and one that most people could not accomplish themselves so they would either hire or um, or get someone to do it for them. And it was a dedicated kind of trip. It's estimated that Epaphroditus would have spent one and a half to three months traveling just to get there. So consider that for a moment. Consider, like, consider, consider that church. They're saying, listen, we have word that Paul is in trouble. He needs help. Is there anyone that can send a package? Is there anyone literally that can take a package to Paul in Rome? And I don't know how it all came to, came to fruition and came to be, but Epaphroditus raises his hand and says, you know what? Yes, I'll do that. Knowing this could take me one and a half to three months at least just to get there, not counting the trip back. We're talking about an investment of at least half a year. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pause my life here. I, I, I'm willing to leave home. I'm willing to leave my family. I'm willing to leave my church family. And I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice of my time and energy to go and accomplish this task of bringing this package to Paul. Now you think about the travel conditions back then. In that time, the risk of injury, robbery, imprisonment, even death were extremely high, particularly as a proclaimed Christian traveling through a Roman-occupied land. So again, it's not just the time, but it is also the risk. 
and certainly all of the things that could happen along the way, including sickness, which he did succumb to and almost died from. All to deliver a package to an apostle who desperately needed it in a prison somewhere in Rome. This is the heart of Epaphroditus. This is the level of sacrifice that he was willing to endure for the sake of helping a brother in Christ out, a servant of the gospel. Does ministry come with risk? Maybe not in the same way as Epaphroditus, but certainly the answer is yes. There is personal risk as you step out in faith and share the gospel with others. We have outreach coming up soon. That can be scary. That takes time. Is it worth the risk? Yes. There is financial risk as you step out in faith in your giving of resources to the work of Christ. Sometimes there is family risk as you step out in faith, trusting that God will take care of your family needs. Perhaps the Lord is working in your heart about quitting your job and working in full-time ministry. That is scary. What about your family? What about all the things that you can't control? Is it worth the risk? Epaphroditus would say yes. Ministry does not exempt us from suffering. So why do it? Paul says, because it's worthy. It is worthy of honor to sacrifice for the sake of the ministry, for the cause of Christ. When you step out in faith, we are showing the world that there is no other calling that is so worthy. There is no other higher purpose. There is no greater cause than that of our calling in Jesus Christ. And his calling on our lives, though there is, worth, there is risk, it is worth the risk. It is worth the sacrifice. And Paul says it is worthy of honor above all else. As we close this morning, my question to those who are followers of Christ here today is, are you living and serving ultimately with the mind of Christ, but also as we see exemplified the heart, the mind of Timothy and Epaphroditus? Paul has given us two wonderful examples in these men of what it looks like to do so. Timothy, the example of selflessness, prioritizing the needs and the desires of others above his own, willing to put the interest of Christ above his interests. We see Epaphroditus, the sacrificial, the suffering servant, willing to give up whatever he had, including his life, if that's what it took for the cause of Christ. What are we willing to sacrifice? Are we willing to be uncomfortable Ministry can be costly. It can be difficult. People may hurt you and let you down. Folks, ministry is difficult at times. And anyone that has been in it for a while or has particularly led in ministry knows the truth that it can be hurtful and hard. Yes, you'll have people that will say things about you. You'll have people that may complain about you. You may even lose friendships. But is it worth the risk? Is it worth the effort? Is it worth sometimes the suffering that is involved? Absolutely it is. Paul calls a life given in sacrifice to Christ, a life that is worthy. Two great men, both following the example of Jesus. And as we close, I again want to point you back to Jesus because without Jesus, none of this matters. Jesus was the motivator behind Timothy and Epaphroditus and in turn, every other believer since then, that is the motivator. He is the motivator. Jesus, who became obedient unto death, the death of the cross. Jesus had a servant's heart. He endured a servant's hardship, and he in turn received also a servant's honor. And that is the pattern that Timothy and Epaphroditus followed, and that is the pattern that all servants of Christ should follow. So the question is, what kind of servants are we? Are we selfless? Are we counting the ministry of the gospel as worthy enough to sacrifice of ourselves for it? My prayer is this body of Lighthouse Baptist Church would endeavor together in unity, in humility, and be dedicated to, the, uh, to accomplishing the work of Jesus, but not just accomplishing the work of Jesus, but doing so also with the mind of Christ. I hope that's your prayer, your desire as we've seen here, exemplified in the lives of Timothy and Epaphroditus, accomplishing the work of Christ with the mind of Christ. Let's pray.